good morning, good afternoon, and of course, good evening, wherever you may be. We've got Pinball Royalty with us today. I'm absolutely privileged and honoured to have with me uh, Mr. Josh Sharp. How are you, mate? Good, good afternoon. I guess good evening to you. I feel shorter than you. And if I'm the... Oh, man. That, that, hold on. Let's see. Hold, my hold chair. on. Hold hold on. on. Yeah, I'm still shorter than you. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can, Here we go. I can... Hi, Chris. I can How's it going? Oh, I'm How's good. Going I'm really good. Oh, mate. It's... um. It's amazing, amazing to have you on. So I was, uh, we were just discussing it for those of you uh, uh, are tuning in. We, we just had a little chat for five minutes before and I was just discussing how I was, I, I just watched the uh, the Pulp Fiction featurette from Straight Down the Middle. Josh was on there and, and Mark Ritchie was on there and, and they were um, chatting about all things Pulp Fiction. And at the exact time that I watched it, like I am, I'm all over the place. I had many windows open on on the PC, and uh, and and Josh's name popped up on Facebook. I thought, oh, hold on a second, this face looks familiar. So I contacted him. Uh, thank you so much um, for uh, what well, for joining us, really, Josh. Of course, happy to, happy no. to. I saw your you you spoke some kind words about Pulp Fiction that I know our whole team has seen. So we. Uh... We appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts on it. Now that they were good thoughts, if they were bad, then you know you could fuck right That's, up. But. I'm quite right. You can have standards, haven't you? Uh, it was. Uh, I was genu genuinely enthusiastic about it. It was funny enough because I was discussing this with a friend the other day and the importance of of theme and, and so much of what you said in that. I want to touch on. Sure. So we may we may sort of jump forwards and backwards in time because I'm keen to um, I mean, I don't, your story is so well told, but I'm so new to the hobby. I, I want to maybe ask you some questions um, on, on a few of the things from your, your childhood and your early influences with pinball. But when when I watched that Pulp Fiction um, video, I was discussing about theme the other day and some uh, so when you're my age, I'm, I'm almost 50. There's, there's all sorts of different nostalgia. So at the moment, I've got a, a Scooby-Doo machine, which is um, in my house at the moment, which very, very uh, Pimble Heaven very kindly lent it to me to review. One of the perks so, of the job. Hey, uh, that'll do. Um, it's, uh, and it's, and that's, there's nostalgia. So there's childhood nostalgia. And I'm watching, so I'm watching that and seeing clips that I know. But you've got a whole different nostalgia, adult nostalgia with Pulp Fiction, um, which was just such a, a wonderful film. So it was easy to be enthusiastic about it, Josh, but what came across was how enthusiastic you guys were. You seemed genuinely excited on, on that video, it has to be said. Yeah, um, we we were, we are, we continue to be. I don't think you can fake, you know, for us, I, I think with pinball not being our real jobs here, you know, we, we pinball has been kind of this side project, even for us as a company like you have to be enthusiastic about it because if you weren't there's no we don't have to do this right where i feel like if if, if this was our day-to-day -day business and we need to keep the line running and it means we need to get a new game going whatever license we can get or whatever like at some point you just have to like make the next game and that's your job and for us you know we're fortunate enough with our day job in you know video game arcade that space that this isn't our real job so with that comes the sense of being able to like take our time and do you know take take all the time we need to get it as right as we want it to be because we're so passionate about making you know exactly what we want to make could you explain what, what that means me? is our time budget and our money budget it's all just been terrible for business but i'm kidding yeah but uh yeah, it it but it becomes a, a labor of love, which is yeah, which is clear. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain to me the difference between a raw thrills and Chicago Gaming Company? What's what's the situation there? Because I, I don't fully understand. I understand that you work for Raw Thrills, but I understand yeah. how that can manifest itself so into a pinball machine. Chicago Gaming use they make our cabinets. They were one of our cabinet vendors for Raw Thrills for our big arcade games. Okay. And they actually used to be a contract manufacturer for us earlier in our company's history. They said, I think when they started manufacturing their own games, and this is more of like when Arcade Legends started happening for them, pre-pinball, but their, their own games monopolized their production line. So we moved our production elsewhere, but they continue to make cabinets for us. 
right. they continued to do through the end of last year. And now they've really focused all their energy on manufacturing their own cabinets, manufacturing, you know, keeping their pinball line running. And, uh, but throughout that process, I mean, we've known the owners of Chicago Gaming for 20 years as raw thrills, but longer than that when you account for everyone's sort of relationships within the industry pre raw thrills. So you didn't, um, so raw thrills or the, your team didn't, weren't involved in cactus, the cactus Canyon remake and no. that. No. Okay. So you, you just got involved. That's, with me, yeah, that's me on the side. Okay. Okay. So how, how did that come about that, that a whole team and yourself would go over to and help or, or however it worked out? How did that come about that they approached you? Why, why didn't they just do um, Pulp Fiction for instance, without your input? I think they, you know, for us, I think we were actively working on this thing and we need, I think George tells the story the best that, at, you know, George and Mark, as they were, for better or worse, building our own homebrew over at, at Play Mechanics, as we needed parts, we knew that Doug made Medieval and Attack and my, like the dude has a pinball factory. So, you know, we were just asking him for stuff and then we'd ask him for a little more stuff and we'd ask him for a little more stuff. And at some point he's just like, what are you like i'll keep sending you whatever you guys want but like what the hell are you guys doing and mark and george sort of told him you know what we were doing we were kind of just doing this on our own kind of with, without a real plan of like how is this going to get made we were kind of making a game for quentin and sort of the project morphed over time into being something that could possibly be commercially sold and oh and you were making a of, private game for Quentin Tarantino. That was kind of the gist of how how things, you know, really started and being able to turn it into a commercial venture and realizing the best way of getting this thing made as Doug got involved, he expressed interest in being able to sort of handle that part of the business. They had the infrastructure set up with a sales and distributor network. They had an infrastructure set up with a production line and those are things we don't have at Raw Thrills even for our own uh like we don't have our own sales force for our arcade games. We have a distributor partner that handles all that for us. Okay, that's amazing. Um, and so, at what point did it did the crossover go from Quentin Tarantino wanting a pinball machine to it then becoming okay official? We're, we're doing Pulp Fiction. How did that happen? I think it was pretty early on in the in the process. I, I think once, uh, like. By the time things went to contract, there was definitely a path towards this being like a real thing and not, uh, you may not know, but like the Stern, what Stern had done in the past, like making a Michael Jordan pinball machine or an Aaron Spelling pinball machine. These were like one-off custom jobs okay. that they still got paid for. So, you know, there was an, there was an avenue for like, if, if Quentin wanted a pinball machine for himself, and would be willing to pay us ten million dollars to make him a game. We'd probably make a game for him. For I, I probably would for ten million dollars. So, yeah. the 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 opportunity for us to make this sort of a, a worldwide launch product was, or before I knew about it, that it was all settled. I was brought in much later, as I started trying to peek into what Mark and George were doing. Well, I I, I was I was blown away by um by the game by the um. By the timing of the announcement, there just seemed to be a, a, a machine gunning a pinball machine announcements at the time. Foo Fighters got announced. Um, Godfather, uh, I think American Pinball uh, announced something as well. Spooky, well, Spooky had announced Scooby Doo. I think that maybe came before Pulp Fiction. It was definitely in the yeah. It was March, right? Because I think yeah. our, for our licensing agreement, we had to announce before for March 31st, I think, or or extend the contract for that to not happen. And we just decided we, we you know we went for it at that time. And our game is so weird and different compared to everything else on the market. It kind of it to us it didn't matter of like, oh no, you know, you're you're going in and 850 other games have been announced at the same time. It's like, okay, you know, whatever. It, it, it's fine. It will either it's either going to stand on its own four legs and speak to people or it's not, regardless of the timing. Um, I mean, a risk, I think, to at a point where everything is getting bigger and not, not necessarily better, but everything's getting bigger, louder, 
bigger screens, more stuff going on in, in terms of the screen. If I may say, I think personally, detracting maybe from what's going on on the play field. So as I'm on this voyage of discovery, I've I've so I've just recently purchased an eight ball deluxe, but I'm discovering this stuff for the first time. I'm finding myself regressing in in those sort of terms and and going backwards and sort of getting rid of maybe some of the more modern games. And and I think so much of that stuff is happening on the screen. And I know you're 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 a great player yourself, but for us, um, you know, less. (laughs) I mean, immortals, we, we can't often look at the screen during uh, the game. For me, too. For me, too. I think, you know, George Gomez said it best many years ago, I think, when uh, Jersey Jack came out with Wizard of Oz. And George made a comment that I still believe to this day, which is the game is on the play field. Yeah. That is where pinball happens. And displays have always been about scoring and display effects for entertainment value and some kind of informational purpose, but the game is on the play field. That's, totally where, that's where the magic happens. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I've, we've been doing, um, I've been doing like a top 10, um, not top, I was doing a top 50 series, uh, uh, but the rule being that the, the games have to have lived in this household because I don't think it's fair to compare something that I've had here, but friends over for a barbecue or a pizza with something that I played once on location in a noisy arcade. And one of the things I factor in is sort of that fun element and how approachable. And and, and you touched on this uh, in, in the video that I watched. People love a bash toy. And I'm talking about my, my non-pinball friends. They, they love a bash toy. They love the play field to tell you what's happening. It's got to be intuitive. Basically, you might get away with reading the apron card. But realistically, that game, that bash toy and the inserts and the lights so have got to tell you and the theme the meat and bones of, of what's got to happen in that game. And I found that very much so. So it was interesting to hear you talk about rules with Pulp Fiction. You very you very much indicated you thought rules had got too complicated. Yes. Even, even, as, a, yeah. even as a player at a high standard that yeah. you are? Yes. I think Keith, I just listened to some <clears throat> podcast that Keith Ellen was on where he sort of said the same thing about, like, it's <laughs> modern games today. It's just really, really exhausting to learn what to do and i'm in enough slack and discord channels listening to excellent players trying to figure out what's going on by talking about it with like the programmer themselves or other high level players and if you're in a situation where the best people in the world need help in answering these questions what is the world of casual people going to do with that like it's to me it's it's beyond ridiculous you know i i am good enough at pinball and and i used to like i should be able to with a game powered off look at the play field and intuitively know what to do yeah from from start to finish you know you look at adam's family and it's like oh there's some mud there's a chair there's a question mark question marks probably the end but you know how do i light the chair maybe you don't know and that's something that's like I don't know how I'm going to get those. Maybe you read the apron card and it's like, oh, okay, you can shoot a ramp to, but it's like all that, that whole, it's like trying to find a treasure and not having a map. It's like the game is the map. And yeah. and if you're, if you don't have a good map, you're just wandering the fucking desert, you know, hoping yeah. to strike gold somewhere. And you're probably going to end up with sand a lot as you walk around getting nothing. That is exactly right. It's what my kids love. Monster Bash. Um, where's Dracula? Well, it's, it's obvi- obvious where Dracula is. Obvious where uh, Brad, Bride of Frankenstein is. Obvious where all that stuff is. And it's just so many, you know, the mummy popping out the casket. Uh, so much good stuff going on there. And and I, and I miss toys. I really do miss toys. So to hear the way you spoke about Pulp Fiction and to see so many toys on the play field, it, it did. It it just it just looked um, looked like a feast. Really, uh, the more I looked at it, what was your your precise involvement, uh, Josh, on that? What what did what did you assist with on the game? I pretty much got handed the keys to the rule development on the game. So, I mean, I think by sheer will, I kept it. You know, they they had some stuff in place. I remember reading their first outline of a rules doc and was like, "Oh God, this is fucking awful. What are you guys doing?" And then just started 
like, you guys know what would be a good idea, blah. You know what would be a good idea, blah. You know, just day after day of like, hey, looking at the drawing more, and, you know, this could be fun if you guys do this. What about that? And at some point, they were just like, why don't you write something up and, you know, let's just see where it goes. And oh, it sounds great. And, and you know, I've spoke to it in the past, but like, I like pinball rules development is like a hobby of mine. I'm like a nerd, you know, I'm a pinball rules nerd. And my involvement over the years with the different pinball companies and the programmers in particular that I've known for most of my life, you know, I, I was a teenager bugging these guys about like, you know what you should add to this game is bah, 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 bah. And so that's that's been a natural course of my life since you know, in my childhood of of thinking of a rule that I think is fun and sharing it with the programmer of the game. So and, how does that work? Because, again, I, I've heard you speak about this, how you said you've done some work for Stern. You've done some you, you've helped out a lot of people. How, how does that work? Bear in mind, there's got to yeah. be some form of rivalry I mean, between the manufacturers. No, I, I mean, going back forever, like, I mean, I these people have all known me since I was a child in this sure. industry through my dad so yeah you know these are all personal relationships that i've had for most of my life and it's obviously pinball is a game that i am extremely interested in in life and i just fight like i fire off emails or i make phone calls like i don't care because i just i want every game that exists to be as great of a game as it can be regardless of who makes it like make a good game for the world to enjoy so pinball can outlive all of us and continue to entertain my kids and their kids and their kids, you know, forever. And I'm playing games from the 60s and 70s that like that should be the case. Oh, you know, there sure. should be people in 80 years playing Monster Bash now and experiencing it for the first time and having a great time. So for me, it's just never being bashful about playing a game and feeling like, I mean, if I search my email for like, Lonnie.rop at Stern Pinball or Dwight Sullivan at Stern Pinball. It's probably a long list of emails of like Aerosmith thoughts. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I sent an email to the Stern crew with Venom thoughts this morning. Blah, just me word vomiting, mostly useless information. But like, you know, if, if anyone's willing to read it and listen, great. Well, I think you've got pinball, um, pinball's future, oh, it's probably his past, present, and its future at heart. And you're doing it from a good place as well. I think that's probably um, the it's point. In the blood, uh, for sure. It's in the blood. Yeah, well, uh, funny enough, um, I did love, there was one thing bothering me about your dad's film. And he just addressed <laughs> it at the end. He just addressed it and he said, um, he said I think at the end he said, I never sold that pinball machine. Oh, that's good. That's good. Because it was, I, I was tinged to anyone that loves pinball. It was the sad point in the film. Oh no, he sold his pinball machine. I loved it he, at the end. He's never <laughs> sold one. It's kind yeah. of, and he has some bad games too. But <laughs> uh, 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 he is right about that. He is not. Um, so what's your earliest memory of of pinball then? Um I, I mean, it, 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 it must have been like just crawling around and it was just there like a coffee table. There are pictures of me playing before my memory is pretty shitty, but there's a picture of me at like I don't, one and a half or two, something like that playing an evil Knievel at our apartment when I was that young. So clearly that that's the earliest picture I've seen. So I don't remember. I mean, I remember pieces of, I mean, I used to have nightmares about the back glasses of the games coming to life. Like the chip. my dad had a Barracora and a flash and I can remember like the flash lightning dude, you yeah. know, I mean, and the Barracora fish lady scaring the crap out of me when I was really little, like, like, it's always been. It's been a constant. Hey, look, Gorgor Gore still frightens me now. It's, yeah. But it's like trying to ask someone, like, do you remember the first time you had a bite of pizza? And it's like, mm. uh, no, I have no, I've, no. I've had pizza a gazillion times and I cannot remember the first time. No, I no, cannot, no. I cannot remember. No. Um, what What about in terms of, as, so as you're growing up, um, what about being aware of your, your father's position? in sort of the pinball world. I mean, yeah, I, he's just dad, obviously. Um, but then w when do you start becoming yeah, I, aware that actually this is a bit more than just a hobby here? Sort there of thing? was probably some early pinball expo when I was, you know, 10, 9 or something where like 
Zach and I are bothering him to go play games and like he's getting stopped for people asking for his autograph and just thinking that was fucking weird. <laughs> but yes. like and and obviously it's understandable that like when you go to a pinball nerd convention that like my dad's autograph would be something that people in that capacity would be interested in. So I think sort of learning about that at about that age that I I doubt I had any connection to you know the like the story from the movie you know him the the pinball book and the testimony and stuff i'm sure i didn't appreciate that until much much later in life yeah yeah for for, for sure it's bound bound to happen so what about in terms of so you're growing up in this sort of pinball mad household and, and i'm assuming your dad is as enthusiastic about pin as has always been as enthusiastic about pinball as he always was yeah there were i mean there's a rule in my house that if you came to visit and you didn't go in the basement you would think that like we were a normal family sure and in the basement it is far from normal and my dad and my mom my bless her heart you know they did not have the same strategy that that i have at my house like i grew up and like my headboard was the side of a twilight zone cabinet for my bed yeah you know, i grew up with an adam's family and twilight zone in my bedroom Zach grew up with a Jack in the Box and an NBA fast break in his bedroom. In our dining room has two pinball machines in it. The living room has eight pinball machines. There's just pinball everywhere. And the basement also is full of pinball. They're just everywhere. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that is a magic way to, to grow up. So what about, because obviously you've got, we'll talk about the IFPA um, in a bit, but it, obviously I almost look at it. So, but there's many reasons people are into pinball, you know. Some people like restoring them. Some people just like going to clubs and playing them. Some people like the competition aspect. And there's lots of different ways you can be. Some, some people just collect them and don't even play them, you know. I mean, so there's there's lots of different ways. Yeah. At what point do you do you think you're aware that actually I'm I'm quite good at playing these games, and you knew that that was maybe something you wanted to explore? Um pretty or and i see it with my kids now like you know we'd have the neighbor kids come over when i was a kid and zach and i were clearly much better at this thing than anyone else who came yeah. over but i think like my dad really shielded us from competing and i didn't my first event i was 13 and zach was 11 and i i won the first juniors competition that i played in so i mean at some point it was like okay we're we're pretty good and what was it? What was the prize? It was maybe like seven hundred and fifty bucks. Hey, that would do. Yeah, it was all right. That would do when you're thirteen. Nineteen ninety three dollars too. Yeah. So it's probably worth like four grand today. Wow, wow. Who knows? Yeah. But it was, it, you know, I always and, and Zach and I, you know, we would play a lot and we play a lot with our dad at home. So like, and the the brotherly competitiveness for us it, that that drive to be better than the other brother. It's kind of an extension when we got out to playing, you know, everyone else in the world that like we enjoy competition regardless of what you're doing. It just so happens that we're really good at this one weird thing. Do you get nervous when you play in tournaments? I don't. Okay. Okay. I don't. I, I get not... nervous watching if I'm watching Zach play okay. or my son just went to a tournament and my oldest son came with me and he played in his first one and like i am a nervous wreck watching how old is how old your oldest son he is 11. okay and he okay. did great i think there were like 80 people and he finished somewhere in the 30s you know 30, 35th to 40th place somewhere in there so he played really well won a couple games and he uh yeah i can't i couldn't watch him though it's just i think it's the sense of being out of control and for me i have so many hours logged of being in that competitive situation where you're at the buttons that like to me that's a very natural position for me to be in it's like a comfort food so i love the challenge of needing to like play in that moment yeah but there's a difference that vibe yeah there's a difference between that though um so i've seen very good players before and it's, i'm not even just talking about pinball here i'm talking about you know other other things as well you know but uh you know people are very competent at something but you put them in front of a crowd and then nerves. So, so you could, 
you know, you can have all that upbringing, can't you? And, and, and play against Zach. And I, it's absolutely that sibling rivalry can certainly push your ability forward. But if you, um, if you're going to crumble the moment 50 people are watching you, then you're going to have a bit of a problem, aren't you? I think uh, that comes with, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years now and there was definitely, you know, those moments really early on where you can feel that impact you in a way that, doesn't allow you to perform your best in that moment because you know the adrenaline stuff is happening that isn't allowing you to perform and there is nothing like losing a lot over many years for you to be like you know I come up I get myself into this situation and then you blow it and it's like you got at some point you just get over it and it's like f this like just play and I I think it's just amount of time I've had to deal with those emotions that it doesn't bother me at all to step up in front of as many people as you want down as many points as you want like give me the ball and let's go let's see what happens well clearly you've got you've got a love for it i actually would say that it's a funny thing to watch actually a pinball competition because there seems to be in the main genuine goodwill amongst everybody uh, no one see people are obviously disappointed if they don't win but it's open encouragement there's competitors it's a bizarre thing uh, for, just from coming from a non pinball background competitors sharing with each other what a particular machine is playing like yeah you know so it's there's a kindness uh, to to pinball and i don't just mean in competition just generally it's it's a very benevolent and and helpful i think um, it probably helps that no matter what, it's kind of an indirect form of competition, right? Like I'm not playing you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like I'm playing against you on this neutral device. Sure. And we both have to manipulate this device separately from each other and the best person can win. That I feel like sort of lets the guard down in terms of like holding back secrets or it's like, I'm going to play my game and I'm happy to, it's a very nurturing environment, at least the people that I interact with. And it's like, we'll both go perform as best as we can perform and and leave it out there. No, I, th I think that's really great. And I think what is what is amazing is that you still, after a whole lifetime of pinball, you're still there typing an email to Stern about the new Venom release. You're clearly as enthusiastic about it um, as, as ever. What does... So can we can we go back to maybe the the start of the the IFPA? Uh, certainly your inclusion, sure. your involvement in it. Because I mean, you, you're pretty much obviously you've got a lot of people that that help with it across the globe. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but it's you, you know you're 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 pretty much the driving force behind it. What motivated you to to do that to get into it? Well, just just uh, talk me through that process, please. Ego, my own ego. How? I think, I mean, so I really, the new IFPA was kind of uh, the catalyst that brought that on was the creation of the world rankings, the world yep. football player rankings. And I can remember at a previous job, sitting in my cube, not working very hard, reading whatever newspaper articles there were for the day while I was watching the time slowly pass. And I had read an article on marathon running and how as a way you know these independent marathons existed sort of like just on their own you'd have the boston marathon chicago marathon i'm sure international marathon that, yeah. that like this event existed and then that was it and the same people would show up to them but there was no connection between one and the other and as a way to try to raise the level of awareness and interest in marathon running as a sport there was the creation of this ranking system that sort of linked now these former unlinked events into being a part of sort of the same program. So while you were running these separate things, there was now a system that was letting you know how good you were at all the things compared to your peers that were doing all the things. And I thought that would be really cool for pinball because you know, being from Chicago, there were certain events that I played in. You know, I played Pinball Expo and I'd play in like the international stuff, but there were tournaments in Europe where I knew there were really good players or in er other areas of the US. And what a great way to try to indirectly 
compare yourself to your peers. How good am I at this thing? I can go show up to a tournament and finish in fourth. It doesn't mean I'm the fourth best player in the world. It was I was the fourth best player that day in that moment. So this world ranking system allowed us to sort of aggregate a bunch of these one-off things that were previously unconnected and make a system where like I could argue that I am better than my brother right now at pinball. Why? Because of my list of accomplishments versus his list of accomplishments. And it's kind of, it was born from that and has continued to this day from that. Did you expect it to grow in the way that it has internationally? No. Oh God, no, no. I mean, I think there were 50 tournaments a year and 500 ranked players. The first time I sort of cobbled, I mean, I had to go to rec games pinball. There was no Facebook back then, but like searching the internet or my dad, cause he's a hoarder has all these, ma- you know, old industry magazines that would sometimes have pinball tournament results in them. So it's like finding results wherever I could to populate it into this rankings. Like the best I could come up with was 50 events and 500 unique names. And I remember thinking like, if we could ever get to a thousand names, how amazing that would be. If we could double the number of people that played our little game, you know, that would have blown me away. So we are well beyond that. And the number of events a year. I mean, to be at 50, 17 years ago, and to be at, I think it's 8,000 now, we'll probably eclipse 10,000 events this year. No, I mean, this is all crazy, crazy talk numbers to me. Do you, do you know what you are? You must, r- roughly, what what, are you, what numbers are you at in terms of, I, I guess, regular participants? Oh, you, there you go. You... I do, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's, it is, it's like amazing. If only there was a website that... I, I mean, yeah, for sure, for things. sure. So we are at, as of today, 6,000 events in 2023. That's amazing, isn't it? That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it gives these events. Oh, well, you'll know this. Uh, I just, I've come to realize this. Uh, it gives them validity and authority. Yeah. I think, I mean, being a part of some bigger vision, it does hopefully give legitimacy to events that are starting up to sort of make players aware of the event's existence and be able to grow from there. And I think I mean, you... we've, seen, we've seen events that did not exist when the ranking started that have now, you know, gone on to become some of the biggest events in the world. Are you aware that the, um, that the points allocation and scoring system can cause some controversy? I people, no, yeah. it, You can't make something without half the world thinking it sucks. That's what I've learned. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it sucks. It's just, um, uh, it would be, the, it's the same. Uh, my, my friend is a match fisherman. And uh, so they go, they go and sit by a lake and have these fishing tournaments. And sometimes it's done by by volume, sometimes done by number of fish. And and you're never going to please everybody. And and the, the person with the biggest fish thinks that he's won. And the person with oh, the yeah. most fish think that they've won. And someone thinks, hold on, this, this, surely this, this big fish is worth five points. How come four of four of those smaller fish are worth seven points? It, it's it's I'm impossible. Pretty- it, it really is, and I don't think it matters um, what hobby. But I think you you do a, a tremendous job, really, and that's got to be it's got to be quite frustrating sometimes. No, 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 no. Well, you're a very patient. I think you're a very patient man. Surely, I think I I don't know because it probably helps that I'm an active participant in this. That mm. selfishly. Like at, at some point, if you, I mean, if you sat me down on a couch with a therapist, I'd probably say, I'm still doing all of this stuff for me. And if nobody else likes what we're doing, fuck off. I'm doing, I enjoy it for me. So yeah. that, that makes it really easy for me to kind of not give a shit about those that don't think highly of some of the choices that we've made because I think it's right. And and, and if I think it's right and I'm doing things for, you know, the history of what I think is right, like, I'm just going to own that and yeah. and we'll see how it goes. And, normally, and, and except you can't please everybody. I, th- I think that's yeah. the thing. In, in, in anything you do, you're never 
Stern are never going to produce a game that everybody's happy with, and it doesn't really matter what you do. And by the way, I've just heard so much more praise. It's genuinely a badge of honour for, I think, for an event. It's the first thing people ask if someone's having an event, oh, is it is it IF? PA ratified is it uh, how many points you get you know so people are, are genuinely interested and it gives certainly the good the good players of which I'm not one a chance to go to different events and, and chase the points and yeah. just gives you something to aspire to and as I say just gives every every event authority um I think it's I think it's absolutely magnificent so do you uh, in terms of your own playing it's got I guess you've played for so long now, your own skill set and, and and your brothers as well is going to be well entrenched. Do you actually practice ahead of a tournament at all or just, just sort of rock up and play? No, I mean, physically practicing, I play as much as my, I mean, I play a lot of Pulp Fiction now because I'm still play testing the crap out of it. Yeah. But, and uh, like, I'll play like my youngest who is four, four and a half. I was home during COVID for 15 months while our we are we went remote and worked out of the basement and played I hope my boss doesn't watch this played a lot of pinball during the day during random smoke breaks outside of my office to go play but like my four-year-old is obsessed with pinball brilliant and way more than the other two older kids yeah. so he I am I mean there isn't a day that goes by that that he's not dragging me down there to go play something or like he likes taking the glass off. And I mean, he, he figured out, he uh, got to the question mark on Adam's family yesterday. Cause he was, you know, playing with the round with the glass off and he understood sort of like how we talked about earlier, like understood what the inserts were saying, understood that like that when the yellow lights on, it means I get one of these inserts to finish and worked his way and like explained to me, he explained to me how tour the mansion worked. And it's like, brilliant. And it, it, it was amazing. Like he'll do that every day. You know, he'll, he'll you know, I want to play monster bash with the glass off dad. Can you take the glass off? And it's like, sure, bud here. And then, you know, I'll hear him get to monsters of rock. Cause he'll understand how to get the instruments and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so he has reinvigorated the, my interest, not that it waned at all, but the interest in playing at home. Like I will spend a good amount of time with him at home. Or if either of my if my dad comes over, Evan will drag him directly into the basement to start oh, really? with him immediately. Immediately. Does um so he's four. Does he realize I mean I've got four kids, so I'm just trying to think Ooh. at four years of age. Um, does he realize that there's a film about granddad? He no. No. He yeah, he's seen it, but yeah. he, he he wouldn't know. No, no, no. The other two saw it and obviously realize uh, that their dad and my dad are crazy. Yeah, for sure. What's his favorite game? Um, the four-year-olds out of interest. It is. I don't. It, it changes every day, but it's Monster Bash. It would be it's Monster great. Bash. It's a great game. I mean, you mentioned Gomez earlier. Um, it was a fantastic, fantastic game designer. Um, and, and actually going back, this would be my my thoughts on him. I think he gets it. He he understood that. Um those those rule sets and getting people engaged with, with simple rules. And he even he's well, a, a, a Deadpool. Let's go with Deadpool. I know he was under time constraints to design that, but it just works and it's and the rules are simple and you know what to do on that game. And um I was just, you know, Gomez just done some amazing games, really. Uh, and that's that's my kids' favourite um, Monster Bash as well. So it's a difficult one. I'd normally, I'd normally ask people what their first game was. Ha. I can't. I can't. Yeah, I, I can't. No, I, I can't. don't. No, you, you don't have any idea. One of you? my dad's five that he had when I was born. So What would have, what would have five he had when you were... You... Uh, Buckaroo. Funland? No, Funland was at Seth. So Buckaroo, Sharpshooter, Evil Knievel, Flash, and Barracuda. No, I was around before. So maybe those four. Maybe Funland. Evil Knievel is probably... It's the first game that I can really remember enjoying as a kid. How many games? How many games? Did, so 
he continued to get games clearly yeah we were in a studio apartment in new york so yeah. um, they and i think he had four or five games in that apartment i don't even know where i slept as a baby i think i was i think they raised their bed and i my crib was underneath their bed but yeah it, well, it's like it you was, say he's a hoarder it's one thing being a hoarder and being into cds there's another <laughs> thing being a hoarder and having having pinball machines right <laughs> it takes up a lot of space doesn't it just what about in do you is there one game that I'm, I'm looking for this moment this one game that that he brought home which was just above and beyond anything else you'd ever seen is, is there a game that sticks in your mind just like, wow you know just something yeah like twilight zone probably yeah like I, by then i was older like i remember because he would get games from work from time to time sure and adam's family was certainly amazing and I, I was fortunate enough for that to go in my bedroom because every other room was filled with stuff. And I mean, I could, I don't even know how my parents let me get away with it, but their bedroom was right next to my bedroom. And I would play that thing until way too late, every just over and over and millions of times. I mean, crazy. And I think when Twilight came out and I can remember like them coming over and lugging that behemoth up the stairs into my bedroom oh yeah and like it just blew me away. like i had no idea what i was like the sense of discovery on that game with so many devices and so much going on and kind of having no idea how stuff connected because i was whatever 13 12 at that time and like it just blew me away blew me yeah away. i bet i bet have you got a um yeah you're gonna have to i'm gonna have to press you on this actually what's your favorite game my favorite game is Pulp Fiction, Chris. <laughs> oh, um, oh, you're a diplomat yeah, and a politician, as, as well as a head of IFPA. Um, probably Walking Dead. Really? Oh, you're one of those. I'm one of those. I'm a Lyman disciple. You are, yeah, so am I, but I like Batman. <laughs> yeah, Bat Batman, Batman's all right. I think... Uh, to me there, there's a couple of holes in batman in terms of like where the massive scores come from okay. that to me like walking dead is just perfection like there's no there's no golden path towards ultimate success on that thing there is if you can survive that that beast of a, of a layout because it is really hard it's terrible it's, ter it's, it's horrendously difficult yeah. and i think that's also why i like it too right because it doesn't it, it's like it's like chapter skipping a bunch of stuff it's like let's get to the good part of the movie let's go and it's just like it's this battle from sure. the media yeah. and the ability to score really well quickly like it's just a a hyper version of a really great competitive game yeah absolutely it's gonna be people um that sort of regular watchers who have joined me on my journey from the start of the channel when you said that they're, they're gonna be laughing they're gonna be laughing they're gonna be laughing because i've actually had um had walking dead twice actually and uh not for the faint of heart oh it's really it kicks my ass yeah. it, it it really it really really does but funny enough going back to what we were saying about that that hook to get people into it batman's got the crane and um, and actually, the crane's probably the hardest part of the game. Actually, that, that's going to give you the most jeopardy because it can go the ball can go anywhere. But it's something for something for the kids to do. They think, okay, I, and, and to get the crane is easy because it's the scoop shot. It's penguin. So it's pretty much the first thing you can do. Um, loop it round, hit it into hit it into that scoop, and get the crane going. And it's just one of those games, you know, um, that that will get people hooked and yeah. get the kids get the kids playing it um which i, I do think there's, there's far too uh, far too little of that okay so um i will ask you another uh, this you probably weren't expecting this one what's your favorite shot in pinball it is the the hole in one shot of no good gophers well it's not the first time somebody said that it's a met like just the like all the feels that you get from there's because of the way the shot is set up you know you have the slam ramp go down that you it's it's never an accident there's always this antis you 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 shoot the ball and you truly don't know if it's going in or not but most like i will know the moment i hit a shot that like is it going to make the ramp or not you kind of know it's, it's like it, your timing felt off or whatever you kind of know immediately with this, it's like you make it up the slam ramp and then 
if it's like you look up and you're hoping with the you're hoping as if like you have no more control over what happens and if it finds its way to go clunk into that thing it just feels great do you have a no good gophers i don't because it is a buggy mess yeah but yeah that shot yes that shot is golden it's it's a it is, it is a great okay. shot. Um, we'll we'll get back to Pulp Fiction a bit, uh, but uh, so I, I'm taking it out of the conversation because because uh, I because well, I know you've got one. I know that's what you're playing. I know you're you were um, uh, working on it as well. Um, what 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 do you, what are your last last couple of games that you've that you've had at home? Godzilla. I have all the El- the Elwin games have been my last uh, whatever five games <laughs> oh really <laughs> or four yeah his stuff behind walking dead i think jurassic park is probably my next like favorite game to go to yeah well it does it does work doesn't it it really it really does um yeah it's uh yeah i i, I think that's i actually really enjoyed the shots on avengers infinity quest but the, yeah. the, the rules i just was just too much it, it's, uh, it's a little it's a little out there i kind of you know I, I have my path of how i play it i don't think it's the most a lot of these kids have the the way they use the mind gem to be able to spot stuff for themselves my old ass can't get there so i have i'm a time gem person but yeah, it's a little out there for me rules wise but like the shots are awesome especially oh, they're amazing that Captain Marvel ramp works. It's yes. great. If it doesn't, it can be frustrating. But uh, yeah, that's the steep one. The steep one in the middle, isn't yes. it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. But a, a really good use of the um, of the upper flipper in that game. And yeah. um, but funny enough, that 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 has really good use of the upper flipper. Actually, that's that's really that's really working for me on um, on Foo Fighters. Yeah. Do you do you get um, so? I mean, do you get invited? You must get invited to play these games early, right? I don't anymore since pulp became a thing but okay. i will continue I, I have my ways yeah off the grid to stay connected have you played Foo fighters well, i have do you like it i think it is super cool i like the layout i i think the i was talking to somebody else about it and it's it's very easy you know, you hear a lot when when a game comes out and it's kind of underwhelming. You know, the term that you hear is like, "Well, it, is, it just kind of felt uninspired to me." And and what I would say to Foo Fighters is, it felt very inspired to me, like yeah. just this very unique exploration of a layout that is is just unique and very cool. Well, I think when I heard, I mean, they were really enthusiastic as well. But I think there was a stream. I don't know if it was the reveal stream or the, um, but it was it was obviously you know Jack Danger and all the team there. Uh, they had a similar few enthusiasm to your guys actually. Your team on Pulp, you could tell they really wanted to do it. So they were working late into the night. They were they were messaging each other at, at two a.m. and it was clearly something that they that they really really wanted to do. Um, so I, I didn't ever feel that there was when that landed and nothing was going to be found wanting they i don't always get this with every pinball machine i always think did you did you make the best pinball machine that you possibly could i think that's always a, a question um for me and, and i think look i've got i'm lucky i've got two i've got the premium and the, the pro <sighs> there. It's not, not for me no um again pinball heaven got to thank pinball heaven for um allowing me to, to review and we did a side-by-side comparison um, you know, look, has the pro got everything on it? You know, I mean, it's it's missing toys and it is stripped down. That, that's the truth of the matter. But in terms of what they would have had to work with, in terms of the bill of materials, in terms of the the art, Dave, you could tell there's a lot of love went into that machine, and you could tell it was it was being it was being really well well driven. And that's something I got from um, from your team. So how I, this this is the point i don't know what you can say and what you what you can't say so if you can't say just as much as me. i can as okay as I can. so um when when's that gonna hit when's not that i know i've got that when's pulp fiction gonna uh, hit the hit the street so to speak Do you know? i would love to be able to tell you okay i don't know no. i mean i know that there is a bunch of inventory ready to go and stuff is happening i would hope i mean they said 
October shipping. You know, third third quarter ends on September 30th, and they said it would be shipping by then. So I hope before October 1st, games will start to leave the factory. How's it going? Um well, how, how's it going? Your, your one, your one at home is—is is it is it developing nicely? Obviously, the play field and the toys are all in place. Yeah, the code it, and the rules and it's all that all, stuff. It's been done. I think what ends up happening, and this is something that I've learned through through watching the sausage get made, is that as stuff gets polish, so you're not even changing rules; you're just changing some light shows, or you're safe, you're changing how something mechanically is behaving in a certain situation and you can break something that has been working for a year and all of a sudden like this isn't working anymore this didn't used to be a problem and now it's a problem like there was a, a i just sent a bug to george about some light show that is now no longer working when this specific edge case works and that was never a problem before and it's like, and then you learn like, oh, I was in, I was in the code related to lighting, changing how something worked. And it's like that you change something and then it breaks something somewhere else. And that's where like the play testing has to catch all this stuff. But in terms of like code functionally complete, the entire game is in and has been for over a year, I, almost two years probably. But you'll do. There'll be. You'll do updates after it. You think, or is, or is it? Are you just saying it's done? Oh no! I mean, it'll be. It'll be done when it ships. Amazing! Amazing! I as mean, it should be as it should be. Ship I, I totally agree. Ship again. I totally agree. I, I, I totally agree. I, I always say, you know, when, when my fridge gets delivered, I don't have to do a load of stuff to it before it starts making my food cold. You know, um, it, it just it just sort of works. But I, I'm so excited about this game and. Um, to the to the point where I found it almost hard to focus on on any other new releases. Obviously, you know we do stuff for the channel and whatnot, but I'm I'm very very focused on this uh, oh, pulp sure. fiction. Appreciate the interest. We were uh, well. I guess I can speak from it. Like I was cautiously pessimistic about how it was going to be received in the marketplace. So were I, you? Oh yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? I think because I work for Eugene here, so we're always at least at Raw Thrills. We're always pessimistic because then you could be pleasantly surprised when things go well it's true it's true it's a, it's a good way to live uh was, was that to I, do with the lack of the D, the, the um not the dmd the lcd screen because yeah. you, you're going back you're going back it's retro no right? ramps no display no. i mean it's not a it's not a modern pinball the way that the a modern pinball buying audience like i had a lot of reservations about like I never had a res like reservations about like I know the game's fun because I know what fun pinball is and we're, we made something that's fun. To me, it was more about you know how much of this community won't even give the game a chance because they're going to look at a picture and be like, "Oh my!" Like gas just discharge displays. Like I'm out. See ya. You know, no ramps. No, I'm done. And it's just and not and it's like as long as we always said. You know, as long as we can get this game in front of people and they play it, we know they're going to like it because, you know, we we have enough pinball IQ on our team to know that we did something that's fun and intuitive and want, you know, you want to keep hitting the start button. All the all the good things that you look for in a good game, we feel, you know, we eat our own cooking. You know, we feel like it's a really good meal. And it was just a question of how many people would dismiss it without giving it the chance to inspire them by playing it. Well, it's one of the first things I learned, actually, you know, play a game. You've got to play a game. Even if you think that that might all be there, the theme, everything might be there for you, you don't know until you've played it, really. Um, I think, I mean, from an outsider's looking in, I think you timed it perfectly because I think you just, so much of what all of you said in that, in that feature, I think so much of it resonated because i just felt it started to become a little bit too complicated screens doing a little bit too much um not enough toys in these games the, the stuff that attracts you to it over complicated rules and i think you just the timing of it just to bring it bring it back hold on let, let's go old school and in terms of of this channel and in terms of my own voyage of discovery uh my friend keith had just lent me well, a little while, a couple of months before that, he'd lent me Dolly Parton, okay. which was 
I mean, everything else was new sterns in here. That, that, that's that's what it was. And so I had this Dolly Parton and, and it, it used to live in the corner over there where the puppets are. And I just had this wonderful game. Where I just had to like Dolly and like Parton, um, you know, rip the spinner, get the bank of targets down. And that sort of gave me my love. That's why I ended up getting an eight ball deluxe. So I've got a Flash Gordon. Um, probably shouldn't have said that. Anyway, I've got a Flash Gordon com coming in um, nice. very, very soon. Um uh, to you know just to play for a while it's a friend of mine's lending it to me and for me having friends over we would end up that's what they would end up playing dolly parton because i just say like the letters rip the spinner and they like the simplicity of it and that's what they would gravitate towards pinball, pinball is hard enough man when you know what you're doing if, yeah. you know if, if, if pinball when you don't know what you're doing it's not it, it's not any harder it's just less fun because you're just you know you're you're confused and doubting yourself and it's like it's still even when you know what you're doing it's really hard and it's really frustrating and yeah. because you're missing shots or you're getting bad bounces sort of the ball is wild part of pinball that like you know let's get to that fun and we and i think it's part of the reason why we talked about earlier that like you know even when you have com competitors playing against each other there's a freedom of sharing information because the game is still a bastard to play yeah and yeah. whether it's like hey where do you where do you like the modes on this game like for me to be able to tell a competitor oh you have to hit one of the ramps oh okay thanks that doesn't make the ramp for them it's still just as hard as it was before but they have the knowledge of like knowing what they need to do and they still have to execute it and the execution part is the most nerve-wracking yeah i mean it absolutely is it's um well it's that thing i always think it's a lord of the rings where you can hit that ring shot all day all day not a problem. The moment it means right. something, yeah. You know, where's my muscle memory gone? That's, you know, it's it's that's the magic. Um, that's the magic. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, one thing I did want to say to you was you were talking about um in the Pulp Fiction video, the the quote, your favorite quote from Pulp Fiction, oh, shit. and I love the outtakes at the end. By the way, um, mine was actually and has done, and this this is how you know you've got a good theme. When years later, and it's actually myself and my mate Marcus, still to this day, we're both we're both, you know, both 49, 50 years of age. And any time uh, either of us makes the other a drink, it's this. <laughs> so it's not a quote. It's just it's just uh, it's just a silence. Um, uh, final final question before I before I let you go, Josh. Yes. Has this process of being heavily involved in a game like this is it? This the first time you've done that, right? Is that right? it officially yeah, yeah without the emails and, and just yeah being involved yeah like officially being on like on the team and certainly sort of the leader of this area like yes it was a childhood dream come true there is no happier person on this planet than than me i mean i have i have notebooks filled with fake rules to fake games that i've been designing since i was a teenager and the ability to get to be that guy for this thing was better than my wedding day chris well, wonderful you've got you've almost got like a double buzz to it haven't you because you've got the buzz of the announcement and then you're going to have that extra buzz of it hitting you know whatever the the, the location people's homes you're going to get a second um, i hope so i hope so oh you the will game, if, if it i mean that'll be up to the response of the people who get their hands on the game right like that's uh that's all we can do we're going to we feel like we made the best version of this game that the world could have possibly made. And there will, like, like you mentioned earlier, there will be some group of people that don't appreciate it and that's fine because yeah. you can't please everybody, but we hope that there's a, a much larger group that appreciates what we've done and, and really has a fun time with it. Has it put you off doing it again or would you fancy doing this again? Uh, I would do this all the, I mean, I'm doing it with Cactus Canyon now with the up, update. Like it's all, it's oh, all. Okay. Sorry, no, that wasn't the last question. That's that's, oh, your, yeah. that's your fault. Yeah. Um, uh, so Lyman was doing a code for cactus because people would be annoyed if I don't ask this. Lyman would say we both were. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So that's that's part. Well, of I used your... to say that he's like, no, we were doing it together. And so he, uh, yeah, he was he was very adamant about me not discounting my own involvement. So that's I wonderful. Was. Yeah. That's wonderful. And uh, I'm, listen, I'm very sorry about your friend as well, very much so. And I'm, I'm sure he'd be proud of um, of 
whatever you do uh, to finish that. And that'd be something yeah, that everyone. You know what? He actually he played a lot of Pulp Fiction across uh, that development, and and really. Oh really? And and so for me, you know, the fact that he, you know, he had no problem telling our team that he really enjoyed the game, and then had some feedback for this was or much earlier in the process, but for how he would have done some things. And it's like, you know, we would discuss it. Our team. It's like, well, listen to Lyman, man. Let's do what he said. He's a yeah. Kid. Well, I've got to say that um, we, we, we were lucky. We were very lucky. So again, got to thank Pimble Heaven. We had the, the first cactus in the, it was well, still the only cactus in the UK uh, oh, came wow. here first. And I, was, and I was able to do a review on it. What a game. Again, fun. So approachable. The kids love it. And it's it's a great great game. So I'd certainly, um, my friend Spencer, who um, who helps me run this channel, he he's um, he's getting a, a Cactus Canyon as well. So um, he's he's on, got one on order to buy one. So we'll very much be looking forward uh, to this wonderful new code that you're working on, Josh. I've got to thank you, mate. I, you know, thank you so much for for joining me and um, spending an hour of your um, well your hard press time. You've got two jobs, really, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I guess real job time today, but that's okay. No, any, yeah. any time my bosses here know that I'm a sick and twisted pinball person. So they, no. uh, they support my disease. Well, I, I probably should thank you on behalf of everybody in pinball for ev everything you've done for the one. Well, what is the best hobby in the world? And uh, thank, thank you. And I know you're going to, I know you do it all with love and you just want to see the hobby thrive. So I uh, thank you so much, mate. Pleasure.